Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to the Avexia webinar series. Our topic for tonight's special webinar is next generation testing for tick-borne diseases, how to get started using iGenix Laboratory. My name is Joanne Iverson. I am the Director of Client Relations for Avexia Diagnostics and will be your host for this evening. Tonight, I have the distinct pleasure of being joined by an exciting guest, Dr. Joseph Barascano, Jr., who will be our presenter for this webinar. Dr. Joseph is a well-recognized specialist in the diagnosis and treatment of Lyme disease and associated infectious diseases. He has over 35 years of research in this field and is also a founding member of ILADS and ILADS Educational Foundation. Joining Dr. Burascano tonight will be Wayne Sedano, our Director of Clinical Support and Education at Avexia Diagnostics. Additionally, Dr. Sedano is the Director of Integrative Medicine Education for the College of Integrative Medicine and lectures and teachers internationally. Before we begin, just a bit of housekeeping. We encourage participation. So if you have a question, you may submit your question in the questions field in the right-hand area of the interface. We will answer questions submitted towards the end of the presentation. If your questions are not answered this evening, you will surely receive an answer by email within a day or two. In addition, you have the ability to download the slides to follow along with Dr. Baranesco's Bur pr presentation by clicking the download button in the handout section of the webinar's interface. Without further delay, I will now turn the webinar over to Dr. Burascano. Joanne, thank you very much, and everybody, thank you for joining us on the webinar tonight. I wanted to speak to you about some of the testing that's offered by Igenix. And, you know, I'm a clinician, and I wanted to emphasize the fact that the testing that they offer, on, and I'm not an employee of the company, I'm just a user, okay? But I'm doing the webinars for them. But I have to emphasize that um, the reason people are using Igenix is not only because of their quality, but because it's a whole different level of accuracy compared to the standard CDC testing. I'm going to be spending some time tonight going over the nuts and bolts and kind of a really deep dive into the technology of testing in general, and then and how it contrasts with the newer generation testing from Igenix. Then I'm going to go through each of the different major tick-borne diseases and apply the basic knowledge that hopefully you'll absorb. Now. There's a lot of stuff here. We're going to go through it, unfortunately, pretty quickly. So you'll probably need to rely on handouts and other things and reviewing the slides again. And I apologize in advance for my fast New York speech. So here we go. Let's get this started. All right. So as I say, we're going to go through the general information, a very brief history of Lyme. And it's important because it sort of sets the stage for why the government supported testing the CDC standards are so wrong um, and how that led to misdiagnoses, denial of Lyme disease, people being sick um, and practitioners being actually harassed because they claimed Lyme disease and the test didn't show it. Um, so we'll do the deep dive into the testing methods and then we'll go through the major illnesses that um, we need to talk about. I'm going the wrong way. Here we go. So in 1970s, there's a community outbreak of arthritis and Bell's palsy in children and adults in Lyme, Connecticut, and the local resident, Polly Murray, became an activist. She finally got the CDC to send someone down, and that person is an immunologist and a rheumatologist, not an infectious disease person, and that's because they didn't know it was an infection at the time. They thought it was maybe a virus, but probably an autoimmune disease, and that began the bias that still exists, because to this day, the major funding for Lyme research is through the allergy, oh, I'm sorry, the um, the rheumatologic and immunology branch of the NIH and not through the infectious disease branch. Well, come along the 1980s, Willie Bergdorfer, who was a tick researcher for the NIH, collected ticks on, on an island off the coast of New York, um, Shelter Island, um, which is about 20 miles away from Connecticut where Lyme is, and that's along the bird flyway. So he collected ticks there, and he actually discovered a spirochete in the ticks, which eventually became the spirochete known to be causing Lyme disease. And that's, in fact, why they named it Borrelia burgdorferi in honor of Willie. So by the early 1980s, they developed simple serologies. Um, there were IFA-type serologies. We'll go through that in a second. And these became the prototype test for 
all future testing for Lyme disease as supported by the CDC and NIH. So in other words, they use this tick-derived Borrelia um, as the standard um, to judge all tests then and to the future. So the problem is, this is a strain of Borrelia that number one, came from a tick, not from a human being, may never have tasted human blood, and that makes a difference. Second of all, it came from an isolated island off the coast of New York, and now we know there are many, many different strains and even different species of Borrelia in America. And so this one little strain from one island in New York may not reflect what's going on elsewhere. And it's very possible blood tests based on this lab strain, they call it B31, really doesn't reflect Lyme disease elsewhere. And if you have Lyme disease from elsewhere and you do a blood test based on this B31 from New York, you may get a false negative result. So going forward, FDA used this lab strain and when I'd say a lab strain, when they're grown in the lab and culture, which it has been ever since the 1980s, they change, they lose genetic material, they lose plasmids, and they're now lab adapted. And they're really, really not like what's happening in human patients. Anyway, going forward, anytime there's a blood test that the FDA is going to evaluate and want FDA approval, the comparator, the standard upon which the test is compared is this blood test from a lab strain from New York from the 1980s called B31. So even back then we had patients and I was there. I mean, I knew Willie. I mean, he was in my office. We talked about this. We went to conferences together. Um, many patients fit the clinical picture of Lyme and they did not have a positive test. So that's why. I mean, it was a single strain of Lyme. It was not reflective of what was really out there. And over time we started to recognize that in addition to Lyme, people started to show up with other infections. In fact, they probably had them all wrong, we just didn't realize it. We found Babesia, then we found Ehrlichia and Anaplasma, then Bartonella, then we found that Borrelia is actually a grouping of spirochetes. Um, they call it Borrelia burgdorferi sensolato. I'll show you that in a few slides to come. And so there are many different Borrelia, not just the one line Borrelia from that one tick from New York. Now, why is it important to talk about the other germs in a, in a tick? Well, in, 19, in 2018, um, Igenix looked at over 10,000 patient specimens and they found this, that over 37% were positive for Babesia species, 32% for Lyme Borrelia, 27, 28% for relapsing fever Borrelia, then you see Bartonella, Anaplasma, Rickettsia, Ehrlichia. Interestingly, 40% tested positive for two pathogens, 15 had three, almost 5% had four, and almost 1% had five pathogens simultaneously. And this is really the basis of what we call co-infections. So if you have a patient and you know they have Lyme disease and you give them a treatment and they're improving but not really getting better, or they're not getting better at all, you have to think, well, maybe they have some of these co-infections. So in laboratory testing, these are the issues. Sensitivity, you don't want to miss a case. Specificity, how specific is that test? Can you get a positive that is really not a positive for Lyme. Is there some false positivity there? So you want a test that's very specific. And also, as I just explained, you want broad coverage. You want to be able to test for as many different potential pathogens as possible because of all the new species that are being documented. One of the tricks that Igenix does is they test at a genus level, not necessarily to species level. So they can say you have a Borrelia or you have a Babesia. Um, and that way, as a new Babesia comes along, it's already been tested for. Most of the testing that's done nowadays for Lyme disease is based on serologies. Serologies are reflections of the immune response to the infection. So I want to go through this graph very briefly to show you um, the, response, the immune response to an infection, tick-borne disease infection. You can measure the immune response through the T cells, um, through the B cells, or through both. So the T cell response is on the graph, the little blue first hump. That is the earliest to react very sensitive very early on, within a few days to weeks after the tick bite. But the sensitivity drops off really quickly, maybe by the end of the first month or six weeks. And then it usually is negative. However, in some really chronic patients, it becomes positive again. And the paradox is sometimes the serologies, which are based on B cells, become negative, but the T cell response, which had been negative, then becomes positive again. As you can see in the graph, the blue at the end starts to come up. In terms of B cells, serologies, the IgM response happens fairly early. It peaks early and generally goes away. I say generally because a lot of people who have Lyme 
still have a persistent positive IgM latent to the illness. Now, there's a lot of studies being done on that, and they found that the infection alters the, the reactivity of the B cells, and they don't change from IgM to IgG. And even a concurrent infection, even a concurrent vaccine, given at the time of acute Lyme, may end up only showing a positive IgM response and not a positive IgG. Now, the dogma, again, from the CDC and all the CDC tests is that a positive IgM response six weeks after the onset of infection must be a false positive because IgM never persists. But that's wrong because in Lyme disease it does. And I'll show you data on that that's really very convincing. Now, the IgG appears last, um, and it generally persists for the duration of the infection, except in really late chronic Lyme, the paradox is the more ill the patient, the less the IgG response, and the more likely they are to be seronegative. So that's the paradox. The sicker patient has the negative test. Okay. So let's talk about basic serologies. Serologies are commonly the IFA and the ELISA. Um, that's what you'll get if you order from one of the major labs like Quest, um, LabCorp, and so forth. Now, there are two different ways to make these tests. Either you can take the whole germ, sonicate it, break it up into little pieces, and use those antigens to make the test. The problem with that is there's so many antigens there. Some are specific for that germ, but some are not specific for the germ. They can pick up in, uh, immune response to other infections. So you end up having a test that may be very sensitive, but very nonspecific. You get a lot of false positives. The other option that they can do is make these IFAs and ELISAs from one specific antigen. So for example, in Lyme disease, they sometimes use the antigen from the flagella that's called the P41. Um, in typical tick-borne relapsing fever, if you order a, a memoitoid test, for example, from Quest or LabCorp, they only target one antigen, the GLPQ. The problem is not every Borrelia has these antigens. Um, and even in the case of P41 flagellin, there are any other, many other bacteria that have flagella and they can give you a false positive. So the whole idea of these serologies, which again is what the CDC is making you rely on, it just doesn't make any sense, okay? The other problem here is that these are derived again from that one lab strain from New York, from that island, from a tick, and basically it's testing for one species of one germ at a time. You're not getting the whole broad spectrum of coverage of the different infections that are out there. So along came a Western blot. Western blot is a way of doing a serology that displays the individual antigens that are showing up, um, or the antibodies, I should say, that are showing up to the antigens in the test. But there are very, very many problems with this. Again, it's made from a lab strain, not the reality of, of, a, of a human infection. Um, when they make this Western blot, they put the sample on a filter paper and um, expose it to electrophoresis, which causes the antigens to spread out. I'll show you pictures in a minute. And the problem is that it's very imprecise because electrophoresis is not a very precise um, methodology. Again, it only can detect one species at a time. And the other problem is how do you define a positive Western blot? Western blots show little bands, little black dots along this little strips of filter paper, and um, they're given numbers based on their molecular weight. So the CDC had a convention a number of years ago in the 1990s where they decided which bands are going to say we should pay attention to and which ones we can ignore. Because again, there's some specific and some non-specific bands. However, these were the days when the vaccines were being made for Lyme disease, and they excluded some very important key Borrelia bands because these are the ones that are being used for the vaccine. They don't want people to get a false reaction because on the Western blot because they had a vaccine. Um, so they ended up excluding bands that are very, very key for Lyme, so it made the test less sensitive, but they included several nonspecific bands that add to the thing being very nonspecific. The result is some of the people objected to these standards, and some of the participants even walked out of the, the meeting and didn't put their name on the paper. So beware of the Western blot from the CDC. Now, what Igenix has done is they completely changed the ballgame here by having not a Western blot, but what's called an immunoblot. And it's not just for Lyme disease, it's for Lyme, multiple species, it's for relapsing fever Borrelia, for Babesia, and also Bartonella. Now, there are many, many differences. Number one, the antigens are not from germs that are grown in the test tube and then broken up and sonicated. They're made in the laboratory, they're recombinant antigens. They take the gene that makes the antigen, they put it in an E. coli with a viral vector. They make that engine in huge quantities, very highly purified with chromatography and the whole thing. And then they 
actually place it on the strip, the different ones, as you can see here. They use a, a, like an inkjet, inkjet printing device um, to actually print the bands out. And these are very, very specific in terms of where they're located, not vague electrophoresis. And they're very specific because they're made from the actual recombinant proteins um, from the germ itself, not from you know a soup of germs growing in a test tube. The result is that in Lyme, you can get all the species of Lyme. In relapsing fever, you can get all the major pathologic species. In Bartonella babies, you can detect many, many species and far more than what any other test can do. And the result is not only that you're getting all these different uh, germs to show up, but it has the highest sensitivity and specificity of any serology out there. And basically, if you're going to do serologies, do not waste your time on iPhase and ELISAs, um, and not even the standard Western blot. Go right for the immunoblot. I'm going to show you data when I get to the individual germs to show you how much more sensitive and specific this is. I'll just make a comparison. Again, on the right, the immunoblot um, has all these bands very carefully lift, uh, lined up and very clear. Look on the left, this is a Western blot. Look at this. Can you tell what's really going on here? Some of these bands are very dark, and that's probably positive, but maybe there's more than one thing going on. Maybe you're getting a cross-reacting virus. Some of the bands are very, very faint, and do you call that positive or not? What if you get bands like this? What is going on? You can't tell. I mean, look at this on the other side, the immunoblot. Huge difference. Now, let me tell you about serologies. A positive result means you have free antibody present in the blood that's been detected. Okay, but the problem is you don't always have free antibodies. In the early infection with an overwhelming infection, the antigens, the bacteria, are there in so much excess that all the antibodies get bound up and sucked into this, into what's called an immune complex. There are no free antibodies left, so you can get a false negative just because of antigen excess. If there's an immune deficiency where a patient's not making enough antibody, you can also get a false negative. And that can happen in people who are misdiagnosed and put on steroids or anti-rheumatic drugs. It can happen in patients with very advanced Lyme whose immune system is, ha is harmed by the illness. Also, there are stealth organisms, especially the Bartonellas and others, where they don't get exposed to the immune system, they hide away, and you don't develop an antibody response. And this is why clinicians add other tests to their serologies. They add T-cell assays um, and also direct tests, cultures, antigen captures, and so forth. We'll go through that. We'll talk about the T-cell response. Again, it, it ex reflects a past exposure to an organism. Um, and what you have to do in the lab is the T cells are harvested, the, the blood is, has to be kept in a good way so that the T cells are kept alive through transit and into the lab. And it's very important when you have labs now that, that are in Europe and Canada that are doing this, you really want this done in America where the test is done the very next day and the cells are alive and, and active. So what they do is, if the person had been exposed to this infection that you're testing for, the T cells are primed. So what they do is in the lab, they put some of the antigen from that organism into the T cell culture, and they see if that activates the T cells, like the T cells are trying to fight this off. And there are different ways of um, measuring in the activity. One way is by using radio pharmaceuticals to see if they are absorbed by the um, T cells. The other way is whether they're um, liberating interferons, and that's what the Elispot does, and that's what Igenix does. And Igenix does offer this for Lyme disease, and also for Bartonella, it's called the IgX spot. So again, if you have someone who has poor B cell response, um, you can do a T cell response assay in addition to or instead of. Now, as I said, it reacts very early, tapers off, but they may reappear in late chronic illness. But because the T cell responses are independent of B cells, you can be having, you can have a positive T cell response in a seronegative patient. Um, so that can be very important to know. Um, the T cell response is done at a genus level, okay? So in other words, it's gonna find Borrelia, positive or negative. Um, so if you have Borrelia Miyamoto, or you have a Borrelia Turricati, or one of the other really oddball Borrelia, you can still pick it up. Um, when you do the test early, early on, or in the very late stages when the T cells are more responsive, the sensitivity and specificity is about 80%. In the less active patients who are maybe a few months into the infection, um, the sensitivity is not that good. So again, the time to use this is very early or very late, and don't waste your time or the patient's blood and money doing it at the wrong time. But this is another interesting thing that I always tell people about. If you think about it, if you're doing immunoblot, that's a serology, that's measuring B cell response. These T cell response assays, the IgX spot, 
if that's done simultaneously, you get a really good snapshot of the patient's immune response. You say, wow, they're responding to by B cell but not by T, or they're responding by T and not by B, or they're responding by both. So it gives you an idea of how healthy their immune response is to that infection. What assay offers is an antigen capture where you're directly measuring the presence or detecting the presence of organisms or fragments of the organism in the urine and can also be done in the spinal fluid. Um, and it's great because it's a direct test where, you know, if it's positive, that means the organism was there and alive at the time you did the test. It's called the Nigenix Lyme dot blot. It does do multiple Borrelia species. Um, it's only for Lyme disease though, but multiple Lyme species. And it does detect multiple different antigens, making it much more sensitive. It's also an interesting test because besides being direct, we can say, gee, it's really there, the infection. Um, there are patients in whom it's not good or, or not desired to draw blood. For example, newborns. If the, if the mothers um, had Lyme during pregnancy and you want to make sure the baby's okay, one of the things I always recommend is you test the baby's urine once a month for the first six to 12 months just to see if they're spilling any antigens. It's much easier to do that than taking blood from the poor little baby every month. They don't like you when you do that. <laughs> now, the thing about this is it's found that NIH did these studies. The spillage of antigen into the urine is not constant. It varies a lot. Some days it's absolutely none. Other days it's sky high. The thing is that the spillage of antigen into the urine tracks the symptom severity. So someone's having a symptom flare or getting a Herxheim reaction from starting treatment or women during the menstrual cycle when symptoms tend to flare, that's the time when it's most sensitive. In fact, some clinicians, when they do this test, they'll give an antibiotic to the patient for two or three days and then collect the urine in three different days, or days, they say one, three, and five, and then they see which one is positive, which one isn't. And that does increase sensitivity. In terms of specificity, the only thing that would um, give a false reading on this is if there's a concurrent urinary tract infection. So we recommend it at least a UA, if not a culture, at the same time you do it. So because the spillage of antigen is intermittent, if you're doing two or three samples and one is positive and the others are not, you believe the positive one, not the negative ones. Another direct test is called FISH, fluorescent in situ hybridization. This is a way to detect the presence of the pathogen by looking for its RNA. And this is actually done on a slide under a microscope where they put an RNA stain um, that's fluorescent onto the blood and they scan it. And sure enough, they show up like little neon lights. And so the beauty of this is that RNA does not persist in the body the way DNA does. So if you have a positive FISH test, which is RNA based, you know the person had the infection at that time, okay? It's a very good way to detect it. It's also the only test that will detect pathogens that are embedded in biofilms. Very important because Borrelia make biofilms and Bartonella is a huge biofilm maker, especially in the bloodstream. And very often you can't get a positive Bartonella test unless you do a fish because of the biofilm problem. Again, this is a genus level test so that even though there are dozens and dozens of Bartonella species, um, the fish test for Bartonella um, can be positive. This is also good for Babesia, um, and we'll get to that too. So early in the infection is when the pathogen count is highest, so that's a great time to do the fish. Another time is also very late in the infection when the immune system is down. Um, sometimes people will draw blood on more than one occasion, and if you get one negative, one positive, or two negative, one positive, you believe the positive, okay? It's like going fishing. You don't catch a fish. Doesn't mean there's no fish in the water. It means you just didn't catch one. But if you do catch a fish, you know it's there. All right. PCR is another direct test. Here they're looking for the presence of the DNA of the organism. You can test blood, body fluids, biopsy samples. Um, if you can get enough DNA, the lab can even do a direct sequencing for direct identification, specific identification of what's there. Um, again, the PCR is genus level, so you have a very broad coverage. And this is available for Bartonella. Borrelia, Babesia, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Rocky Mountain spider fever, and even some viruses. Now, unfortunately, the sensitivity of PCR is very poor when you do the blood. There are inhibitors to the reaction, the technical problem in the blood, such as heparin, host DNA, hemoglobin. Also, the number of pathogens in the blood is very low, usually, and it's very hard to detect on a blood sample. Um, and when the pathogens are in the blood, they're not there all the time, they come and go. So the ways to fix this to make the PCR more sensitive is to draw a larger quantity of blood. Don't just draw one small tube, draw, draw two or three or even four. Um, or you can collect the specimen on several different days. Um, when is the pathogenemia supposed to be highest? Well, 
um, that varies by pathogen, but generally it's highest during symptom flares. If the person's on antibiotics, don't even waste your time on the test because that will make it not sensitive enough to be uh, worthwhile doing. Another way of getting around this inhibitor problem is use fluids like spinal fluid that doesn't have a lot of inhibitors. Urine has inhibitors, but not as much as blood. Another technique is to remove inhibitors. Um, Agenix has done this with a new culture test I'm going to talk to you about in a moment, um, and that has helped. And another thing you can do is you can do a test on a biopsy because biopsies don't have inhibitors. Culturing of an organism um, is a gold standard. You know, you do urine cultures, you do blood cultures for, you know, various things, throat cultures. So it's a gold standard. In the world of tick-borne diseases, you know, it's very hard to get a, a, an active culture because tick-borne diseases are adapted to thrive in living organisms, not artificial culture media. A lot of these are intracellular, so they're not going to live outside of a cell. Um, also, when you do a culture, just as with PCR, the pathogen is not always present in every blood sample. And when you culture them, they grow really, very really slowly. It may take weeks and weeks to get a positive, and by then, other pathogens may overgrow the culture and ruin it. So, very hard to do a good culture, but... Um, the lab at Igenix got over this. It took over two years of research. In fact, even more than that, because I helped them with this years ago with the help of Alan McDonald and, and uh, Eva Sapi and others. And they developed this test um, using hundreds and hundreds of samples. So what they do is they hold the blood for two weeks. Then they test the blood by PCR to see what actually is in, in there and growing. And again, it's a genus level PCR. So you can detect many, many, many different species. Um, and we'll go through each one, okay? So let's say you get a culture and it's positive for, say, Bartonella. How do you know? How do you know it's really that and not something else? Well, what the lab did during the development of the test is every single positive test was sent out to an outside independent reference lab to do a sequencing of the DNA to confirm the identity. Also what they did, they developed what's called a reverse Western blot using the image blot technology um, using recombinant um, proteins. And what they found is that every single sequence matched the initial PCR. So the PCR is 100% specific. And every single reverse Western blot exactly matched the results of the sequencing. So again, two different independent methods of um, validation at an independent lab all showed that this exactly was correct. Now, how sensitive is this? Well, it's hard to report because believe it or not, as you can imagine, there are no gold standards. So how can you say, well, this is what's happening and what does the test show? But doing independent work, you can find a culture that's at least six to 10 times more sensitive than a standard PCR. Um, and that's kind of the way we're going to go forward in the chronic Lyme patients. So again, it's genus level, very broad. In fact, I'm gonna give you some interesting tidbits here. They found some very strange and unusual species that have hardly ever been known to exist in patients. They found a thing called anaplasma platus. Um, it's a dog pathogen. In dogs, of course, it's tick-borne um, infectious cyclic thrombocytopenia. In the world literature, only four cases have been reported of human infection. So I guess Hygienics found case number five. Another thing they found, and this is really wild, in doing the Babesia culture, they found Culpidella. And they didn't believe it, so they sent it out for sequencing. And then they sent it again for sequencing. And again, it was Culpidella. Culpidella is a free-living protozoa that lives in ponds and in the soil and feeds on algae and other things. Um, and it's very distant real, relative to malaria and Babesia. There's a chronic fatigue patient, had nothing showed up in any of the standard testing. So they did the, the culture and guess what? They found Culpidella. Looked at the literature, there's only two cases reported of human infection. Both of those people are on heavy immune suppression. So this is such a fabulous test. It's picking up things that no one even thought existed. Crazy. So, Basically, what I talked to you about is that there are different types of tests. There are the indirect tests, the serologies that look for the immune response, T cells, and so forth. And then there are direct tests. With the indirect ones, the key is to use them when the immune response is expected to be the highest. So very early disease, you have a T cell response assay, and the immune blight, interestingly, is very sensitive early on. If it's dissimilar Lyme disease, but not the chronic case, and the immune system is pretty much intact, don't waste your time with the T cell test. Just go straight to the immune blight. And a late chronic infection, it's really a good idea to do both because you can not only pick up better you know, percentages, but then you know more about how the immune system is, is working, okay? Now, um, if you have a seronegative patient, it could be because of what I said before, antigen excess, where you have more germs than antibody. And so you get a false negative antibody test. 
what I found and I reported this is that about 36, 37% of the time, as you go through treatment, the negative tests become positive because the germ load goes down, the immune system heals, there are more antibodies present. So what you can find, again, paradoxically, is that a seronegative patient becomes seropositive during and after treatment. Um, so that's neat because you can tell if the patient's responding to your therapy because the serologies go up. Um, and also, you don't have to be off antibiotics for these types of tests. You can do a serology, you can do a T-cell response while someone is on treatment. In contrast, we have the direct tests. We're directly looking for the pathogen. That's the new culture. Um, the FISH test, which is where you look for the DNA, on the, the RNA on the slide, the antigen capture, and the PCR. So when you do this is when the pathogen load is expected to be the highest. Early in the infection, before effective immunity develops is when the load is highest. During symptom flares, and sometimes, interestingly, at specific times of the day. I found years ago, doing cultures on Lyme patients, early in the afternoon when the Lyme patient feels really a wave of fatigue and maybe a little bit of chili and maybe um, some fatigue, they just have to sit down, low-grade fever maybe, that's the best time to do a culture or any direct test. With Babesia, you know, the phases where you feel better and feel worse and you can start feeling chilling as a, as a bad phase comes on, that's a good time to do it. Barnell, we don't really know. I don't know if it makes a difference. If it does, we just don't know yet. Now, in this case, if someone is on antibiotics, um, because it, in, you know, it, it hits the, the pathogens, the bacteria, and so forth, that will decrease the sensitivity of these tests. So if someone's already on treatment, don't waste your time doing the direct test because you're going to get a false negative. Now, I don't at all recommend you stop treatment just to see, just to get a positive test. I mean, you need to treat your patients. But if they're already off treatment or if you say, you know what, I want to give you a break of medicine either because of side effects or just to reassess, you know, give her four weeks, maybe even six off treatment, and then you can test and find that these become quite sensitive again. Now, just some anecdotal things. Some people will give antibiotics to make the pathogens come out of hiding. I don't know if that's really logical. Um, others recommend things, physical measures like massage, sauna, other things to get them the hidden organisms out of hiding and into the circulation where they can be detected. So it's just so you know. All right, I spread through this. Hope you're not dizzy yet, because now we're going to part two. <laughs> we'll talk about the individual illnesses and the different tests available for them and why, okay? So Lyme is the most common vector-borne disease in the United States. The Borrelia can live in the tissues, inside the cells, and it does transit through the blood intermittently. Some people say that the nerve is in the bloodstream. Well, of course, that's ridiculous. How would the tick get the infection in the first place drawing your blood if it wasn't in the bloodstream? It makes no sense. So yes, it does intermittently go through the bloodstream. Lyme will evade your host immunity. It also inhibits B and T cells and actually can kill them in a very chronic case. It also inhibits the maturation of killer cells from CD56 to CD57. A lot of you know that there's a blood test called the CD57 natural killer cell test and the levels of the CD57 can be very much depressed in Lyme disease and in Bartonella. And some people use that to help monitor the treatment. Another thing about Lyme, it can shift into different morphologic forms. It can go into cystic forms, it can go into spiral forms and, and blebs and so forth. And these different forms um, have different antibody responses and different antibiotic responses. So it's important to know about that. It can even go into what's called the stationary phase. Um, the stationary phase Borrelia are dormant, they're not growing, so the antibiotics don't kill them, um, and they evade immunity because the immune system is not active against the dormant organism. And as we all know, despite antibiotic treatments, Lyme can persist and become chronic. Another very important thing, as I said in the beginning, is that Lyme itself can be caused by multiple species. Now, I don't know if this slide is in the deck that they handed out to you, but I put this in last night. On the left are the Lyme disease species. Standard Lyme disease, if you want to call it that, by CDC and NIH, the thing that came from a tick on Shelter Island in New York, is called the B31 strain, Borrelia burgdorferi B31. They call that Borrelia burgdorferi senso stricto, SS, senso stricto, strictly B31. Turns out, all the blood tests that the government sanctions is based on that. But look what we have. We have 297, which Agenix discovered from a human patient, not from a tick. This Californiensis, Maonii, Avzelii, Greenii, Spermaniae, Valsiana. Avzelii and Greenii are the European strains. It's had the dogma is that they don't exist in America, but guess what? They found them in American patients, they found them in birds, and uh, people do travel, birds do fly, so it's be silly to say these aren't here because in fact they've been found. 
So if you rely on the standard CDC FDA approved testing, FDA approval requires you have a test that's for B31 and none of these others, you have a chance of missing all of this, okay? Tick-borne relapsing fever, as I showed you in the early slide, is present in about 22% of the Lyme patients. Um, you can get a test for Borrelia hermsii. It's an old-fashioned IFA, very insensitive and very nonspecific. I'm talking about from the big labs. Likewise, you can get a Miyamotoi ELISA, which is based on one antigen, not a whole bunch like you do with a Western blot. But what about these other, Trisica, Tricate, Coriaceae, Parker, Texas Census, and even more are present. So again, the ones in red are the ones that you get from a commercial lab. If you use Agenix, you get all of them, okay? So that's the difference. So again, going back to the bit last slide, Lyme can be caused by multiple species. And this is the picture, okay? So don't get misled by getting the wrong test. You get some of the Guarini eye infection and you get a blood test, FDA approved blood tests and it's for B31, you're gonna get a false negative. So the patient will have Lyme disease. Well, that's not true, they, they do, or maybe they do. Go through quickly the clinical things. Everything about migraines, people talk about this in the early days, and I know I was there, I'm old enough to tell you that. Um, they said everyone with Lyme has a has an EM rash. Well, that's silly because they required an EM rash to be admitted to the clinic, then retrospectively said, oh, everyone had the EM rash. Well, it's so circular reasoning that it doesn't make any sense. But when you look at this, based on people who have documented Lyme and you go back in the history, actually probably half or less noticed the rash, okay? First of all, yes, it can be circular, mainly oval, and it does expand over time, but there are many different appearances. And the reason is they follow skin planes, so they're rarely circular, and some on the shoulder, for example, can even be triangular. When they did the vaccine studies, the most common reaction um, is not an erythema rash, but a small raised bump like a mosquito bite that is red and may persist the number of days and not expand. So this whole thing about EM rash is required for Lyme disease is not true. Also, what if you get an EM rash, but it's in your scalp or in your back? You may not see it, so you miss the rash. The thing about the EM rash is that it's painless, and so it can be missed, but it is raised and it can be warm. Rarely does it itch. If it does itch, it's probably because of a cold infection. That's a good tip to know. And the thing is that even if you don't treat it, it's gonna go away. So here you have a painless rash that doesn't bother you, and it goes away. So some people say, oh, I don't know what this rash is, or maybe I got some poison or something, it goes away in a few weeks, they ignore it. And then a few weeks, a few months later, they have this chronic illness, and that's how Lyme sometimes can be missed if you rely on an EM rash. Here's a typical bullseye. This actually happens very rarely. I think the statistic is less than 10%. Here's one where the rash is all uniform. There's no rings, there's no circles. The whole rash is one, one uh, tone of red. And here's one where the center where the bite was, was darker, then it gets lighter and then darker on the edge. And certainly not circular, it's following the skin planes. What about this? Ringworm, confused for Lyme. First of all, it's scaly because it's using the skin as its food. It's not raised to warm except maybe the flakes around the edge and sometimes it's itchy. A spider bite, spiders have a toxin and at the site of the bite, there's necrotic skin. So it's definitely painful. You can see the scab like you see here. And yes, you may get a cellulitis type reaction around it, which can be a chemical cellulitis as well as infectious, but basically the spider bite's painful and has the, uh, the bite, necrotic center at the bite site. A lot of people don't know about this. This is called the Borrelia lymphocytoma. Very common if you know what to look for. it. Kids will say, gee, I have this hot ear, and when I lie in bed on my pillow, my ear is hot, I can't sleep. Um, you can actually pierce the ear with a lancet, like a diabetic type of a lancet, and take that fluid out and get a positive PCR culture from it. So it's called a Borrelia lymphocytoma. Usually involves the ear, but can actually involve the nipple as well. Um, it's a site of active infection. Another thing that's more common in Europe, because it's usually Abzellii, in some cases of Guarinii, Borrelia, is what's called ACA, Acrodermatitis chronic atrophicans. And I remember when I was a, a medical student in Bellevue Hospital in New York City, we had a lot of patients with this, and we didn't know what it was at the time. But it's very thin, tissue-thin, atrophic skin. We can see the vasculature underneath it. And usually deep to this is a dense neuropathy. And again, you can biopsy the skin and find active growing spirochetes. Um, you can even get scleroderma-like patches involved with this. Um, and believe it or not, with treatment, this can clear up. We've seen it. So in terms of lab testing, again, the standard serologies, you're going to get the big box labs, the IFAs and ELISAs. Then you can also get Western blots. Igenix offers the immunoblot, which is, as I explained to you, in general, is far better. I'll show you the data online. They have a, a new test that's out called a Lyme screen immunoassay. It's like 
what you normally do with an IFA and ELISA, but it uses a recombinant antigen, so it's much, much more accurate. Again, we talked about the T cell response assay, the urine capture. We can also do that on spinal fluid as well. Um, standard PCRs, and then we have the culture, which uses a PCR. So you're actually getting two tests. You're getting the culture with the PCR done at the end. Now, this is some data that I really want you to pay attention to. These, this is a test, a compilation of nine different studies reported in the medical literature on the sensitivity of the commercial ELISA. Average is 49%. In other words, not even a coin toss, okay? Now, if you look at this, here's sensitivity 66, 55, 50, here's 175, 29%, 18%, 14% were picked up, all the rest were missed, okay? The one that had 75%, the specificity, which in the others is 9,600%, was only 81. The thing is, there's a trade-off with the ELISAs and IFAs of sensitivity and specificity. If you make the test more sensitive, you lose specificity, you get false positives, okay? You wanna make it very specific so no false positives, you're missing half the cases. What other disease would you allow a test to miss half the cases, right? Would you do that for breast cancer or AIDS or anything else? Absolutely not. Okay, Lyme, West, and Black. They take Lyme germs, they put it in a culture, they lyse them, and the antigens that come out of this are separated by electrophoresis. That's what you see spread out on these little blots here. So how do you tell what's going on? Well, you line up these, these dots with a standard. Here, the one on the right is a standard, and you know the different molecular weights from the standard, and you try and line up these patient samples with these numbers. The problem is the migration of this, making this thing spread out, is based on electrophoresis, which is not very accurate. Um, and you score positive or negative by how dark the band is, as I showed you before. Do you call this a positive? I don't know. Overall sensitivity is about 50% in commercial labs. The Igenix Western blot sensitivity is about 70%. So it's a little bit better than the ELISA at Igenix, but not better elsewhere. Now, let me tell you about the CDC. As I mentioned, they developed interpretation criteria for the Western blot, but these criteria were not for patient diagnosis. They're for gathering epidemiological statistics, okay? Again, they have bands that are not specific to Lyme. They exclude bands that are specific to Lyme. They're not accurate at all. Bottom line, the CDC criteria are used for surveillance only, not for diagnosis. So if you see it's not CDC positive, ignore that because you're not doing surveillance, you're doing patient care. Then they come up with this two-tier testing. They do see a very sensitive first test that might be not very specific. And if it's positive, then you do a second test that's very specific so that you can like, filter out the false positives. But the first test has to be at least 99% sensitive. And the second test has to also be 99% sensitive but at least 95% specific, okay? In Lyme disease, the two tier is use the ELISA as tier one, it's not 99%, it's 50%, 49%, okay? You're gonna miss half the cases. The Western blot, which is tier number two, is not any more sensitive in most labs, and it's also not much more specific. So again, it's misleading. This was developed for surveillance, not for clinical diagnosis. So you don't wanna rely on a two tier test to be positive. Okay, it's not the right thing, it's a mistake. Now, what about a test that has to be FDA approved or else they're not gonna use it? FDA approval is a licensing procedure. It's not a test of validation of the test, okay? A licensed test is only if you're gonna make a test kit that you're gonna to sell to someone else, like as if you're making a drug or an injecting device. It's something that's gonna be sold and you have to have standards for the selling of it. Okay, it's a licensing procedure. In the case of Lyme, their FDA-approved test kit is based on that lab strain B31, and it's known for their insensitivity. Again, going back to that other slide, 59, 49, 50%, okay? On the other hand, a lab is validated by CLIA, by Medicare, by individual states, by the College of American Pathology. That's what you look for. You don't look for FDA. So if you don't have FDA approval, it doesn't mean you have a bad test. In fact, these so-called lab-developed tests, which are not FDA-approved because they don't want to be FDA-approved, are often more accurate. Now, just so you know, a number of the tests that Igenix offers are lab-developed tests and not FDA tests. It's not because they're not you know, accurate, as I said, it has nothing to do with the FDA. It's that they don't sell test kits, they make their own tests and they do it in their own lab. They don't sell it to other people. Again, a reminder, there are all these different species of Lyme and relapsing fever, right? So in the immunoblot, the antigens that I showed you show on those strips are from multiple species, okay? They, they can go back. They can detect all of these for Lyme disease and all of these for relapsing fever, okay? 
Another thing, they're so sensitive, the IgM in early Lyme has a sensitivity of 93%. There's no other test in the world of Lyme disease in early Lyme that has a sensitivity of 93%. Again, the CDC dogma is in early Lyme, when you have an EM rash, you're gonna have seronegative, it's not long enough to develop a positive antibody test, 93%. In late disease, an IgM in late disease on an immunoblot is 97% specific. So if you have a late positive IgM in an immunoblot, you can't let the critics say, well, a late IgM is a false positive because IgM goes away. No, in Lyme disease, it may not. And here, when it doesn't go away, the specificity is 97%. So again, do not ignore or dismiss a positive IgM in an immunoblot. And again, it's another example of how much better the immunoblot is. Another, this was just done, this just came out last month. The CDC gave blinded test samples of patients who are at all stages of infection, early, middle, late, males, females, young kids, even up to elderly. And they found 100% specificity, not a single false positive, despite using hygienics in-house criteria. And the sensitivity in this one was 90%, very close to what they got with the 93% in the other series. And this is a perfect example of a lab-developed non-FDA test that outperforms an FDA test. And this is the new one, the, uh, the Igenix Lyme screen. Um, again, for early Lyme, it picked up 75%, and late Lyme, 100%. And the specificity was 93.8%. And these were CDC-supplied samples, okay? Relapsing fever, you have to know about. I'm going quickly because we're running low on time. But the map of Lyme and relapsing fever pretty much overlaps. And you say, well, my patient doesn't have relapsing fever. Relapsing fever, if you look in the textbook, is a high fever and a dramatic illness, 104 fever, you're really wiped out. And then after a day or two of this, it, it ends in a crisis with terrible sweats and you're really wiped out. And then once this crisis is over, you go three to five days, maybe seven days, feeling pretty well, and then bam, it hits again. That's why it's called relapsing fever every five to seven days. That's the textbook. What Igenix found out, and other people found out, and this is now published, people had Lyme symptoms. They had the fatigue, the headache, the joint pain, the migratory things, and they tested negative for Lyme, but positive for tick-borne relapsing fever. So it turns out that relapsing fever may present exactly like Lyme, okay? And Lyme tests in other labs are never developed to pick up relapsing fever. So serum negativity may be that it isn't Lyme, it's relapsing fever, okay? So the bottom line here, Look, so there's 543 U.S. patients with suspected Lyme. They had Lyme symptoms. 32% had Lyme antibodies, but 22%, a fifth of them, had relapsing fever, and 7% had both. They all resembled Lyme patients, not relapsing fever patients. So the solution is you always test for both Lyme and relapsing fever in the Lyme patient for your initial diagnosis because you don't want to have seronegativity because you're doing the wrong test, okay? And again, none of the commercial test kit, FDA tests for IFAs, ELISAs, Western blots, PCR, CSA, none of these have been validated for all the Borrelia on my list and not even any of the relapsing fever Borrelia. And when you do relapsing fever tests from the big box labs, you're getting either Herms GI or separately if you order Miyamoto and none of the others, okay? So always test for both. Immunity blots will do that. You can get a separate one for Lyme and one for relapsing fever. And for direct testing, likewise, the culture, you can do that also. So the test recommendations, um, you got to look for the broadest range of species. So you're going to do immunoblots and cultures, even the urine antigen test, T cell response, who's going to use a genus level. And for relapsing fever, you're going to do immunoblots and cultures. And the truth is to get the highest yield, you're going to combine a direct test with an indirect. So you're going to do an immunoblot and a culture. Or if you have B cell um, non-response, you do a T cell response assay on a culture. Okay, you can do a biopsy too. Quickly, we're going to go to Bartonella been found in at least 49 states. Probably this is inaccurate because it's even found above the Arctic Circle. We know of at least 45 different species. Go to a big box lab, you're gonna get uh, Bartonella hensley, one of the 45. Um, fleas, mosquitoes, biting flies, mites, now even red ants have been reported. They now know that ticks can harbor and, and transmit Bartonella. There was controversy about this, but that's proven. Obviously animal bites and scratches, that's why it was called cat scratch disease in the beginning. Veterinarians have gotten sick from needle sticks, and it can be passed from mother to baby, um, again, worldwide above the Arctic Circle. People with Bartonella have an irritability of the nervous system, anxiety, insomnia, panic attacks. It can affect their personality with rage attacks, antisocial behavior, seizures and tremors. It can get 
global dysfunction in terms of um, dementia, depression, even hallucinations, in some cases of schizophrenia have been related to Bartonella infections. Can affect any layer of the eye, in fact, cause retinal artery and vein thrombosis. So if that's in your patient, look for Bartonella. Lymphadenopathy, which you don't see in Lyme, but you see in Bartonella. I had one patient who was ready to get chemotherapy for lymphoma. It was Bartonella and saved him that trouble. Connected tissues were affected more so than joints. So look for tendon, tendon nodules and painful joint uh, capsules. And look for skin changes. Um, Bartonella tracks, I'll show you pictures, and dyslea and geomatosis are red bumps. And also Bartonella is notorious for mimicking H. pylori, gastritis, mesenteric lymphadenitis, and even liver involved. Bartonella rashes, these are the Bartonella tracks. They're not stretch marks. Stretch marks follow skin planes. These do not. Stretch marks are white and shiny. These are red. Um, here they're in all different areas of the body. And here's one where you see they have the linear rashes, but also some red bumps. And these red bumps are called bacillary angiomatosis. You can see that on this patient. So look for these strange non-stretch mark stretch marks, okay? That's Bartonella. You can biopsy that and find Bartonella down there. Don't waste your time on an IFA. It's bad technology. It's only Hensley A. Immunoblot is for all the different species, and it's much more sensitive. You can get a fish for Bartonella. Bartonella is a big biofilm builder. And that's why fish is such an important test for Bartonella. It's a direct test. The standard PCR can get from a number of labs. Sensitivity has been published of only 6%. Don't waste your time. The culture-enhanced PCRs are 6 to 10 times more sensitive when it comes to PCRs. So we recommend, because it's so hard to detect, and not any one of these tests is 100%, you do multiple tests. You do an immunoblot as a serology, you do a fish as a direct test, and a culture if you can, um, because you're going to get a higher yield that way. Again, if there's a bad B cell de uh, defect, a bad B cell function, instead of the immunoblot, you do the T cell test. The bees is like malaria, it's an intraerythrocytic parasite. It's the most common co-infection in Lyme patients. Um, in New York State, 67% of people with Lyme have babesia based on serologies. Same tick that transmits Lyme transmits this. Fever, sweats, headache, air hunger, cough, profound fatigue, a tippy off balance feeling and cognitive dysfunction. Um, other symptoms that overlap with Lyme too. In the United States, the two species that are dominant are Babesia microti and Duncani. Um, and most labs will only do microti. Babesia duncani is actually much more severe, much more difficult to treat, makes the patients much sicker. But there are other Babesia. There's what's called MO1s, Babesia from Missouri. There's Babesia oticolii, which is actually the deer Babesia that some patients are now showing. Diversions is also seen. They've even found um, Babesia canis, a dog Babesia in people. And again, I showed you that Colpidella weird thing that comes from pond scum. <laughs> and even found that in patients. Um, that's Colpidella. So in the hospital, they'd stain the blood smears, a stain the Gimsa stain. It only picks up 1% to 3%. And it's only useful in the first week. So if you're in the office clinically, you're going to do a fish test, which is a smear, looks for the RNA. It's published to be 100 times more sensitive than a stained blood smear. So don't waste your time on the blood smear. Do the fish. Also, it gets through the biofilms. IFA is outdated. Don't waste your time. The immunoblot is far more sensitive, offers a broad species culture, all these would be that I talked about, as does the culture. Okay. So the recommendation, again, because this is notoriously difficult to detect, um, no single test is 100%, and because we're finding these weird atypical things, we recommend the immunoblot and the fish and the culture. If your patient can afford all three, do all three. Um, if they can't afford all three, do the immunoblot and one of the others. And again, bad B cell function, substitute the T cell test for the immunoblot. Gets your family. Interestingly, reports are showing more and more and more people are showing up with these. And if you do an analysis of ticks, more ticks have Rickettsia family organisms than even uh, spirochetes or Babesia. So there's really a lot out there, and a lot has been missed because of poor testing. And the reason why this is important is because these can be fatal. I actually know in my own hometown of a fatal case of this. It wasn't my patient, thank God, but someone, the landscaper guy in his 30s, died from this. Even though he was in the hospital, he pumped with every antibiotic except the doxycycline. They thought he had sepsis. Anyway, Acute fever, headache, myalgias, malaise, low white counts, low platelets, maybe elevated liver enzymes sometimes. In Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and about 5% of the time in ehrlichian anaplasma, there's this weird rash. It's a red spotted rash. And what's interesting is that it is on the palms and soles. Other skin rash infectious type things don't usually do that. 
The other thing, it's a vasculitic rash. So if you were to put your finger on one of the red spots and let go, um, you'll see that it fills from the center and spreads out. Okay, so this is a good thing to look for. Look at the palms and soles and put pressure on and see what happens. Testing the leak in anaplasm, we have IFAs and now we have the culture. Um, this replaces standard piece yarn. Basically, it's the best test out there for rickettsia. Because rickettsia can be rapidly fatal, you do want to do the serology first and at the same time you draw the culture, so get them both. And if the IFA is positive, then you have the answer, go treat the patient. If there's a high suspicion and the IFA is negative and you don't want to wait for the culture, treat them until you get the results back because you don't want a fatality. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, we don't have a culture for that because the government requires viral safety level four, which is like Wuhan type lab security, which none of the labs have. So they only offer serology and a standard PCR. And basically for this, definitely do an IFA on a culture or an IFA and a PCR in the case of Rocky Mountain Fever. Wow, I'm just about on the hour. So I apologize for being so quick. And again, I hope you get time to look through these at your lesion and think about the statistics I've shown you. Because the thing is, you have to be mindful of the full spectrum of tick-borne disease. It's not just Lyme disease. It's not just Lyme Borrelia. It's all the different Borrelia. It's tick-borne relapsing fever, which no one thought about until a couple of years ago when we found it. Um, think about Bartonella, especially in your patients who are having antisocial behavior or kids acting out in school. Um, been associated with developmental delay as well. Knowing how the pathogens behave can help you figure out which test to do. For example, the, um, knowing that Lyme culture is more active in, or more sensitive in the early afternoon is a, is a good thing to know when you bring your patients in to get tested. And as I showed you again and again, the highest yields is obtained when you order a test panel, which combines direct testing and indirect testing, and sometimes involves more than one of each test because you really want to get the highest sensitivity possible. And again, Igenix is the lab people use. Why? They're transparent. They give you statistics. They gave me this data to show you. They use CDC samples and say, wow, we found 90%, 93%, 100% specific. They tell you what's going on. They have publications. They're present in all 50 states. Most labs don't do that. So it's not only important for your patient diagnosis, but also for yourself. I mean, you want to have confidence that what you're diagnosing is true. You also want to have the ability to defend yourself, say, I think the patient has Lyme. Why? Well, the immune block's positive. Well, the two TSCDC tests are negative. Well, we know that only picks up half and misses half, whereas the immune block picks up 93 or more percent. So it protects you, protects your reputation, and it's important to have a test and a lab that stands behind you. Um, they've been in business for 30 years. They've got a zillion different tests. They're CLIA certified, the hygienic certified, the uh, Medicare certified, the New York State. I mean, they're the gold standard lab. More than 10,000 doctors in America alone use it, and it's been used all around the world. Um, I go to Europe for lectures, and they say, oh, we use Igenix. They use it in Australia. So, I mean, this is a place. So, even a doctor in Bermuda uses it. Patient testimonials, you can see this all over the place, even by, without even asking. They say, oh, the Igenix says showed I was positive. All right, we're going to stop here, and we do have time for questions. Um, thank God that I spoke quickly and I didn't forget anything. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to um, Joanna. Joanna, and she um, hopefully will lead us through this. So thank you. Wonderful, Dr. Dr. Veriscano, um, that was a wonderful presentation. A lot of valuable information obviously presented. Very early on um, in the presentation, we had uh, just a couple of clinicians very early on just, you know, asking for, you know, any particular handout or where to start because there's so many additional tests with that. But I think as you went through that presentation, you've got a lot of good slides for that. So um, really just questions like uh, multiple tests for Lyme and co-infection. Do you have have a flow chart to decide what test might be best to start with. Um, I don't know if you can answer that, but I know you did go through a lot of that towards the end. Well, you know, the gold standard test, if you're going to do one test for Lyme disease, it's the immunoblot. Because if someone's got antibodies, you're going to pick it up. You know, the sensitivity is at least 93%, and some studies as high as 99%. So if they're making antibodies, you're going to pick it up. If it's a really chronic sick patient with the immune system may not be that strong, um, you'll do the immune blood anyway to document what the immune system is doing, but then you want to add on a direct test, most likely the culture. 
Thank you. Excellent. Um, we did have one clinician that was not able to download the slides. I just want to make sure everybody knows that there is a handout section where there's a PDF that you're able to download for that. Um, there's really no other questions. I have a, uh, one other question here. I'm guessing that one must have an MD to order these tests. Um, I'll answer that you know, question. That's, that's just... Well, that's an interesting question. That is depends on individual states. For example, in Pennsylvania, I believe nurse practitioners, no, um, naturopaths were not allowed to order testing, but they changed the law and now they are. So it's a state by state thing. I know on the West Coast, um, uh, Washington State, naturopaths can do it, chiropractors can, others can, as, as far as I know, I'm not 100% sure, but again, it's a state by state thing and you just have to check with the individual states or you can call hygienics, they'll let you know. Uh, absolutely, and many of our practitioners are non-licensed, so they do fall under Avexia, ordering those uh, through that, so it is open to non-licensed practitioners with anybody that does have an Avexia account. Well, see, um, that's the reason why people are using Avexia and why hygienics um, linked up, because these tests can be life-changing for patients and clinicians too, and to be able to order them, I mean, why would you be stuck with something from the big box lab that misses half the cases? It doesn't make any sense. Absolutely. Um, uh, Dr. Sedano, do you have anything to chime in on this test or any comments you want to make? And then we'll just close this out and just review how to uh, place an order and be able to order anything from Igenix. No, Dr. Barscana covered everything excellent, and and I, I and I definitely learned some things tonight as well. And I want to thank him for doing this presentation and offering it to to our clients and and essentially the world in general. Doc, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And you know, just as an aside, the Agenix website does have a practitioner portal where you can find other webinars that I've done and scientific articles and all sorts of useful handouts. So the resources are out there. You know, definitely take advantage. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. Get the machine going. Here we go. Just a few minutes. Uh, just a reminder, we do have this wonderful service, Ask the Doctor. Dr. Sedano is here with us tonight. Um, on the left-hand side of your Vexia account, you can al always utilize Ask the Doctor. There's a free email consultation, any help with lab interpretation, questions on clinical conditions, just not sure where to start with ordering or what, based on clients or your patient's needs. Um, so please take advantage of that. I know, uh, Dr. Sedano, you probably will be seeing a lot of questions from this presentation. Um, so it's just a wonderful service. So next slide, please. Sure. And now that we have learned about tick-borne diseases and the value of Igenix testing, I would just like to review how to order the test before concluding this webinar. First, you will need to log into your Vexia account and go to lab ordering, which is located on the left-hand column of your dashboard. You will select or create a patient to assign the test to. Then you will select specialty labs, then go to the Igenix product tab. When you open that, you're going to see many options in there. Locate and select the test or test of your choice. And finally, complete the test order by clicking the green place orders button. Orders can be assigned to your patients to pay Avexia directly, or we can bill the clinician based when those results come back. So it's just that simple. Um, any next slide? That might be the end of that. And then for any questions or issues, you may contact Avexia Diagnostics by email at info at avexiadiagnostics.com or by phone. We are here Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, phone number is 888-852-2723. Also, live chat is available during those times. Thank you so much, Dr. Berscano and Dr. Sedano for this informative presentation. A recording of this webinar will be available by email in the next few days. Thank you again for joining us this, for this webinar event. Until next time, from everyone at Avexia Diagnostics and Igenix, stay healthy, stay, stay safe, and we wish you all the best on your pathway to wellness. Good night, everyone. Good night, all.